despite the perception that we are more connected than ever, many and a growing number of people live in the world with an increasing sense of isolation. Like we're connected. In a week, I may jump on a video call with someone in another country, someone in another state, or multiple people all over the world. Like that's a normal part of my life now. And when I'm not at work, if I want to find out what people all over the place are up to, all I have to do is pull out a phone. And I can find out as much as my thumb will scroll. Pictures, updates, articles, links, information, connections, right? More and more and more and more. The striking thing is that in this world of over perception of connectedness, studies tell us that people are experiencing increasing isolation. And this isn't since the pandemic, it goes back before that. So you can go back to 2018, 2019, you know, way back, and find studies that show this stunning experience of loneliness. And even more so sometimes among younger generations of people. So even though we're more plugged in, we feel further away. And then when the pandemic shows up and you just have to stay in your house for months, all of that is amplified and accelerated. We live in a world that tells us we're connected, but we feel oftentimes more isolated. The church offers us help, doesn't it? I mean, here we are in a room together. <laughs> Some of us were in a Sunday school class. Others of us will be in a Bible study later on this week with other people. But the church is not exempt from this larger cultural movement into increasing isolation, is it? Because after all, if you're going to really get the most out of a a gathered community of believers, it's going to take something. From, you're going to have to offer something, aren't you? Like it takes energy and time and investment and vulnerability, doesn't it? I mean, if you're really going to plug in, you got to be honest with people. And you got to let them be honest with you. And maybe you don't want them to be honest with you. Maybe you'd rather just not go there. Because it's easier, isn't it? Oftentimes. Like that kind of vulnerability can be pretty messy sometimes. And you never know if you can, or at least initially, you're not sure if you can trust those folks. It takes time to build that kind of confidence that this person isn't going to use my vulnerabilities against me. And so in the church, we have space to work against that pressure to isolate, but we're not free from the temptation and we're not even always free from the pressure because it takes a lot to be invested in the community of the church, the ministry of the gospel that's shared. Beyond just those challenges which the folks who show up deal with, there are other kind of cultural assumptions about following Jesus in North America that kind of push us to think, well, like, I can just do this Christian thing on my own, can't I? I mean, if I've got Jesus and he's my Savior, do I really need anybody else? I mean, if I've got Jesus and I relate to him, I'm good, right? And there's plenty of folks who kind of live in that space. Like, let me define my own spirituality. Let me call the shots on how I relate. And, you know, Jesus is cool, but his people are really kind of a pain sometimes. <laughs> I'd ask you to say amen, but I'm afraid, you, I'm afraid you would. So me and Jesus got our own thing going. 
And that's fine because my truth is my truth and yours is yours. Like we run into that kind of thing sometimes and it's easy to kind of get pulled in. And the result is we wind up rather more isolated, don't we? problem we're kind of circling around here is that this gospel-worthy life, a life that increasingly embodies the character of Jesus, a life that honors Christ, a life that offers itself for the sake of another, is only formed, perhaps we could say is only forged, in the context of this community and others like it. Jesus doesn't just save a bunch of individuals. He saves a bunch of individuals and incorporates them into his body. He takes a bunch of individuals and makes us a community. And that's the place where he does his primary work. And it's his pleasure to do it. It's his desire to do it. And we can begin to get a sense of that in these opening verses of Philippians. As Paul's praying, the importance of Christian community just begins to come out all over the place, doesn't it? You get the sense that for Paul, this is like incredibly critical because he gets that, he, like he's isolated. We haven't gotten into the letter yet where he talks about the fact that he's writing from prison. He's a captive, he's in chains, and he wants to be with the Philippians. I mean, you've heard him talk about this longing, this eagerness to be with them. He's praying for them. He's, 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 he wants to be with them. And as the letter goes on, that's going to come through again and again and again and again. I want to be there. I want to, I want to show up for you. I want, to, I want to cultivate the things that Jesus wants to do in your life. I long for you. I'm so grateful that you've sent messengers to me. All that kind of stuff is going to come up. And he celebrates the, the, the ways they can connect, even though there's this stunning distance before them. This guy's isolated from Christian community. And as you read through the letter, you feel like that's a weighty, hard thing for him. Doesn't mean Jesus isn't at work. The Lord is using the church to encourage Paul in all sorts of ways. But the striking thing is how Paul emphasizes that Jesus uses the church to encourage the apostle, even though there's distance. So it begins to emerge this, this crucial reality of Christian community and how formative it is. And how essential it is begins to emerge in this place. And it's helpful for me to know that Paul dealt with those kinds of things. Like Paul knew that ministry can be lonely and isolating. He knew that if he offered himself for the gospel, it would take sacrifices. But he also knew that Jesus was at work in the midst of that, creating community marked by flourishing and wholeness and strength in adversity. And so, as I read this, the thing that just kind of comes back for me again and again and again, I just can't get away from it, is that the gospel-worthy life is a team effort and not a solo gig. It takes a group of people caring for one another in deep, serious ways on a team, in a community, pick your favorite metaphor, whatever it is, like that's, it's togetherness, it's fellowship. It's never Lone Ranger Christianity. I'm out here flying solo or playing solo or whatever. Team effort, not a solo gig. Now for Paul, this comes out in some of the language that he uses. You hear him talk about his gratefulness for the sharing that he has with the Philippians. Let me read a little bit of this to you again. Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you constantly, praying with joy 
in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. He mentions the first day, and if, you want to, if you're interested in the first day, you can read about it in Acts 16. Paul's first trip to Philippi is recorded in Acts 16. Catch it when you get home this afternoon. And he shows up, and he goes down by the river outside the city gates, and there are some people there worshiping the God of Israel. One of them is named Lydia. She's probably the most well-known of the early converts in Philippi to Christianity. And we're told in Acts that God opened her heart. God was at work in her life to make some receptivity to the gospel, and the church in Philippi was born. So when Paul says, like, I'm excited about your sharing in the gospel from day one, that's what he's talking about. That's the vision, this lovely, shared trust in Jesus. I want to linger on the word sharing for a minute. Now, we don't every Sunday do the Greek word is, that whole thing, unless it's really, really important. Today, we're going to do it a little bit, so hang in there. The good news is the Greek word is probably one you've heard of if you've hung out in churches very often, and if not, just hang out for a while and you'll hear it, like in the next 30 seconds. It's coming. This is one like if you go to a church, there's often a Sunday school class named with this Greek word. There's like two or three Greek words. You can, if, if you're going to get a Sunday school class with a Greek name, it's one of these couple of words, right? The word here is koinonia, and it shows up a couple of times in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Later on, Paul talks about all of you share in God's grace with me in verse, uh, that's verse 7. So what's so important about this word? So the word was used in the ancient world for any sort of partnership, right? So like, let's say a couple of business owners want to want to come up with a contract that is going to govern their partnership, that's a koinonia, right? Paul is a leather worker, so maybe you live in the first century, and you're kind of in the, and you're a supplier, and he's got, he needs some supplies, and so you and him form this koinonia. It's kind of a business partnership contract, but that's not all it is, and it's used with great, like much deeper significance in Philippians. Like it's a shared commitment, but when we read Philippians 1, we get that it's a shared commitment with a lot more depth to it than, hey, I'll provide, you pay that. What is it? In Philippians and in the early church, koinonia was this deep, abiding, shared commitment of passion for the gospel. Like this wasn't just like, hey, let's get together and go to church on Sundays. This was, let's knit our lives together and commit to one another, like covenant together and share this ministry for the sake of the glory of God and the good of the world. Now that's important for us because it's really, really, really easy, especially in North American Christianity, to sort of assume that ministry is what the pastors do or the staff. And maybe there's a few people in the, like in the congregation who have leadership and they're kind of helping out with some stuff. But by and large, it's their job. I will say, I don't get the vibe that that's really, we've been together for about a month now. That doesn't seem to be a driving thing here. Like there's a lot more shared commitment to the ministry than in a lot of churches. And I'm grateful for that. That's one of the reasons I wanted to come and partner with you. (laughs) But it happens a lot. We're like in American Christianity, it's almost like church is a spectator sport or something. 